case scenarios to give us a range of values which we can try and plan the future against. And remember, man's use of energy is effectively your future. So, one of the questions we've got to try and answer is how much energy are we using at the moment? How much energy do you think we're going to use by the end of this century? And what are the implications? Where are we going to get that energy from? What's going to happen with our current mix of fuel usage to provide that energy? And what are the potential impacts on climate? Now we're going to also basically look at what we call top-down estimates to make those estimates. And we're occasionally going to compare those so-called top-down estimates, which are usually going to be overestimates and constraints with so-called bottom-up estimates. And of course those bottom-up estimates will be changing all the time. But the top-down estimate approach is quite useful because, as I said, it gives you a, a sort of an upper limit uh, based on the amount of energy available and the types of energy available. Now, when you read a lot of reports in the literature, textbooks, uh, online, you'll notice that they use a lot of different types of energy units. And that can be quite confusing. So, during our lectures, we're going to mainly use joules for smaller energy quantities. We'll occasionally use terawatt hours for discussions about much larger national energy consumptions, large scale facilities, megawatts as well. But we're going to talk about a different uh, scale. We're looking at the world scale, typically over a year, in terms of energy usage. And we're going to use a unit called the Q. How many people have heard of the Q before? It's not a character out of a Star Trek television series. It's an actual unit. Nobody's heard of it before. But it's actually uh, an older American unit. And it's linked to an even older unit called the British Thermal Unit, and 1Q is 10 to the 18 BTU, or British Thermal Unit, which is equivalent to just over 10 to the 21 joules. So it's a big number. And that's why we like it, because it's easy to remember Qs rather than 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 21 or whatever joules or petawatts or exajoules, etc. So these are the typical units that we used in the past, starting out in the old days with British Thermal Unit, which is just over a thousand joules. You'll also see lots of units used on smaller scales, such as kilowatt hours, which is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules, megawatt hour times 10 to the 9 joules, terawatt hour times 10 to the 15 joules. So 1Q, as I said, is just over 10 to the 21 joules. That's a good number to remember. So it's actually quite easy to convert Qs into SI units if you want to. You'll also notice that a lot of reports the use of exajoules. Exajoules uh, is about 10 to the 18, not about, is 10 to the 18 joules, and that's about 278 terawatt hours. If we put that into context, let's look at one report, for example, the United Nations Development Program put out a report on the 2000 World Energy Assessment uh, usage. And they showed that, for example, well, they were looking at the potential for solar energy. And the annual potential, they said, was 1575 to 49,837 exajoules. Those kind of numbers are a bit hard to remember. But, again, putting it into context, that's several times larger than the total world energy consumption, which was 560 exajoules approximately in 2012. But of course, converting that to Q, that's about 2Q. I think 2Q is easier to remember than 560 exajoules, etc., etc., etc. So we're going to be using Q, but remember the conversion factor from Q to joules if you want to get back to SI units. Uh, you'll also find in a lot of reports, um, particularly um, from the fuel industry, the oil industry in particular, that they use energy equivalent units. For example, they usually have a mass or a volume of a fuel quoted. You then have to convert that mass or volume into an energy equivalent. So that, unfortunately, can be a bit of a problem because different fuels, or rather the same fuels, actually may have different fuel grades. 
And so also the method of power generation, how you use that fuel, can actually alter the amount of energy you can actually get out of that fuel. For example, a barrel of oil from Saudi Arabia, which is ultra-refined, might be very different in terms of the energy value of a barrel of oil from, say, Malaysia. A good example might be, for example, one tonne of uranium is 8.6 times 10 to the 14 joules equivalent. But that's if you use it in a standard thermal nuclear reactor. If you do actually burn it in a fast breeder reactor, you get almost 100 times more energy out of the same mass of fuel. So take that into account when you look at masses and volumes of fuels. So, typical energy equivalent units might be, say, a gallon of petrol is about 1.4 times 10 to the 8 joules. A barrel of oil, the best barrel of oil, is about 5.8 times 10 to the 9 joules. A tonne of coal, 2.6 times 10 to the 10 joules. So remember, those units are often used, particularly in economic uh, uh, reports. But we're going to go top down. So let's go back to our original plot of the natural energy flows of the Earth climate system. <coughs> and of course, we get pretty much all our energy from the sun. And over a year, that amounts to about 5,000 Q. Okay? So that's what's coming in. Remember, we, we lose about 30% of that through the albedo of the planet back to space, through scattering from clouds to the atmosphere and surfaces. So we lose 1,500 Q per year. Within the atmosphere, etc., and at the surface, we have absorption and re-radiation, which amounts to about 2,350 Q per year. And of course, the various temperature perturbations, pressure perturbations, uh, etc., combined with evaporation and precipitation cycles, that amounts to about 2,350 Q per year plus 1,300 Q per year. And it's this component here that, of course, will contribute to the hydrological cycle. And we do actually make use of that, as we'll see. So those perturbations, of course, are going to cause changes in the atmosphere in terms of wind. And we can make use of wind, but also waves and currents. And if we combine that with the amount of solar available, we're looking at around about 12 Q per year. It's a pretty big number. We shouldn't forget that there are other energy sources, which are internal, we have geothermal outflow, and there are various locations on Earth that we've been using for over 100 years now, which actually can provide, on small scales, useful heat energy. That amounts to about 1 Q per year. Another source of energy, which is external to some extent, is we've also been using for over 100 years. And that, of course, is the tidal power and that's associated with the gravitational interactions between the Earth, Sun and Moon, mainly. That comes to around about 0.1 Q per year. We should also remember photosynthesis. Photosynthesis converts solar radiation into biomaterial, and of course we are at the moment even growing biomass to produce fuel, biofuels. But the total photosynthesis is only around about 1 Q per year, but that's still a pretty big number. So the question is, what of these different components can we actually make use of usefully and efficiently? Those numbers look very big, but as we'll see, those are top-down numbers. We can only make use of a very small fraction of them. Just to remind you that about 3,000 Q per year is going to be absorbed at the surface of the planet, which is why solar power, for example, is quite important. Now, if you don't like Qs, you can always go back to, for example, petawatts, which is 10 to 15 watts, or 10 to 15 joules per second. So sometimes in reports you'll see these sorts of plots, which give you the instantaneous energy input. Remember, this is the average, so the incoming solar would be 174 petawatts, and you have to scale all those previous components accordingly to that incoming in terms of petawatts. But we'll stick with Q, because it's easier to remember, at least I think it's easier to remember. So those are the numbers that you should try and remember for this course in terms of the income, the reflected, absorption, re-radiation, evaporation and precipitation, uh, photosynthesis cycles, and then we have these smaller ones which we'll see we need to try and make use of. Tidal, geothermal, winds, waves, currents and solar. So those are the natural energy components of our system.
and we want to try and make use of those as much as possible. Uh, just to remind you, remember the top of atmosphere solar flux? We estimated it was an average for the globe of about 340 watts per meter squared. Of course, that can be much higher during the daytime in certain parts of the planet, but remember, sun doesn't shine at night. Average is about 340 watts per meter squared. 77 watts per meter squared reflected back to space by clouds and atmosphere, 23 watts per meter squared are reflected back at the surface. So we've got about 240 watts per meter squared on average, instantaneously, input to the Earth's energy budget. So the total energy absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, oceans and land masses, is actually around about 3,650 3, Q per year. We said 3,000 in the previous plot. That's because we're going to be very conservative and we're going to approximate 3,650 to 3,000 Q per year, just for discussion. Those are the sorts of approximations we're going to make in these uh, lectures. Let's think a little bit about solar power, which is the most obvious. It's solar power absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, oceans and land masses is approximately, as we said, about 3,000 Q per year at the surface. And if we put that into context, in, for example, 2002, 2,000 Q was more energy received in one hour than the, than the world used in one year. Remember, that's 3,000 Q per year up there. Compare that with the fact that photosynthesis captures about 1 Q per year to convert to the biomass. So the amount of solar energy that reaches the surface of our planet is, in a year, twice as much as will ever be obtained from all the Earth's non-renewable resources of coal, oil, natural gas, and mined uranium combined. So what's the problem? Well, if you look at the number in the previous slide, it's the energy density. In other words, the amount of energy you can get per square meter is actually very small. You need a lot of area. So even though if you look at the available resources, it appears that solar, wind, or indeed biomass is sufficient to supply all our energy needs, the use of biomass can causes global warming, we burn fuel. Solar and wind power is not just low energy density, you need a lot of area to collect sufficient amounts of energy, the power is also intermittent. Wind doesn't blow all the time. Sun doesn't shine all the time. For example, you will often see pictures like this. So this is a, an estimate of the direct normal irradiation averaged over a year for the entire globe. Um, the units here are in kilowatts per square meter per year. So this is the total over a year. So look at the numbers, they range from about 800 kilowatt hour uh, per meter square per year to greater than 2,800 kilowatt meter square per year. And you can see it's quite variable. The Northern Hemisphere obviously is much lower for reasons we discussed. It's much better in those um, 0 to 40 degree latitude regions, plus or minus. But there are certain regions where we have lots of cloud cover uh, and other issues where, of course, we can't make use of solar radiation very well. So we have all these practical issues which affect the efficiency with which we can collect power. But that hasn't stopped many countries now uh, essentially trying to maximize their use of solar power to supplement their current energy fuel mix. For example, China uh, recently past the 34,000 megawatt installation and leads the world out of the, uh, ahead of the United States and Japan. If you compare that to Northern Hemisphere countries like the UK, Germany, etc., those are relatively small. Some things to think about. If you look at the numbers, it's less than 0.02% of available resources, energy resources, are sufficient to entirely replace fossil fuels and nuclear power as an energy source. Hopefully that will become clear as we go through these lectures. If we assume that our rate of energy usage, again this is based on 2005 values, remains constant, we know that we're going to run out of conventional oil by about 2045 and coal by 2159. In the next lecture, we're going to actually calculate those numbers and show you how. 
fuel uh, uh, scientists actually come to those estimates using what's called the Verhulst equation. So we should have to calculate that. And those, of course, are estimates, and they will change in practice, because in practice, neither of those resources will ever actually run out, because natural constraints will force production to decline, making it much harder to get what's, uh, what's left of those resources out of the ground. But as they dwindle, we might get improvements in technology that makes it more economically viable to get some of those sources out of the ground. And that's been particularly true, for example, for things like shale gas, fracking, tar sands, even ocean clathrates, or methane clathrates, are being considered. So there are always going to be technological developments to actually increase extraction of non-renewable fossil fuels. So we have to try and take that into consideration. Now, what is it that's going to drive our energy usage going forward? Well, obviously, there's going to be a lot of factors, economics, but a lot of that is going to be driven by population growth. How is the population going to change over the next 100 years or so? And that's key to defining the scenarios that you hear so much about. So population is one of the fundamental driving forces of future economic development and hence future energy use and hence future emissions. Where do we get the information in terms of predicting what those population changes are going to be? Well, there are actually three main research groups who are looking at global population. There's the United Nations, who actually produced quite a number of different um, reports. The last one was actually in 2017, as we'll see. We have the World Bank, which regularly looks at this for obvious reasons. And we've got IASA, which is the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis. That's actually an independent organisation which is unconstrained by political or national self-interest. So all of these organisations take a lot of data, put it together and make predictions about future population and how it's going to change. And if you look at their so-called central predictions, most of them say there's going to be a doubling of global population by 2100. Roughly 10 billion by 2100 compared to, say, 5.3 billion in 1990, when a lot of this information was considered in these reports. Now, in recent population, those uh, sorry, in recent years, the central population projections for the end of the century have declined somewhat, or in some cases, they may even slightly increased in some some of the more recent um, reports. But they're still in line with an approximate doubling of population by 2100. So, 10 billion is a good number to remember. For example, way back in 1998, the United Nations uh, made predictions. They had what's called medium-low, medium-high projections, and they suggested a range between 7.2 and 14.6 billion people by 2100, with a medium of around about 10.4 billion. IASA also came out with a report around about the same time, and they said that, yes, we agreed, 10.4 billion, and they also said that there's a 95% probability that the world population would exceed 6 billion and would be lower, certainly, than 17 billion. And this is just comparing the United Nations, one of the late ones, 2004, with one of the IASA reports. And again, you can see that typically the median uh, uh, prediction for the end of the century is between 10 and 11 billion, whereas the UN in 2004 said it was going to be slightly lower, down to about 9 billion. But that's actually gone up a little bit since then. So 10 billion is a good number to remember. And this is one of the more recent ones in 2017. Again, this is from the United Nations. And again, you can see the median is going up to about 11 billion here, with typically ranging from about 9 to maybe 13 billion. So 10 to 11 billion is a good number to remember. Okay, so that's the population. We'll come back to that in a minute in terms of looking at how that population actually changes and how long it's going to change. But of course, we also have to think about energy use in terms of economic development. Now, this is not a course on economics, but we're going to look at correlations or assume correlations in our calculations of what we call gross world product as an indicator for economic development and hence energy usage. Now, economic development and growth 
are, of course, fundamental prerequisites, prerequisites to, to achieve an increase in living standards, which is what everybody wants. It's not surprising, however, that assumptions about economic development constitute the most important determinants of, ultimately, our emission levels in all the various scenarios you see in these climate models. But, of course, those economic growth prospects are also among the most uncertain <coughs> determinants of those future emissions, which is why we have a range of scenarios. But the typical uh, marker we use is something called the Gross Domestic Product, or GDP, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Now, we don't need to know how to calculate that for this course. It would take a whole course to actually examine that in detail. But just remember, it's a basic measure of a country's economic output. It's effectively the market value of all the final goods and services produced, made within that country in a year. It's often positively correlated with standard of living. However, it can be determined in several different ways, mainly three different ways. In principle, those should all be the give the same answer. For example, there is the so-called product or output approach to GDP, the income approach, and the expenditure approach. Now, the most direct of the three, which you see mostly in reports on television, etc., etc., and in various financial um, magazines, is called the product approach. And that simply sums up, as we said, the outputs of every class of enterprise in a country to arrive at the total for the GDP. The expenditure approach, and again, you don't need to know the details, just be aware that there are these different ways of estimating GDP, and they can vary in terms of the final answer. The expenditure approach works on the principle that all of the product that you produce has to be bought by somebody. So the value of the total product must be equal to people's total expenditure in being able to buy those things. The income approach is different. It works on the principle that the incomes of the productive factors or producers must be equal to the value of the product and determines the GDP by finding the sum of all the producers' incomes. So it's a bit more complicated. Uh, but in effect, it should give the same answer. Now, this is an old graph here, and this is often used to show the correlation between energy use and um, essentially economic development, or GDP. So the vertical line is the GDP per capita for uh, all these different countries, and the horizontal axis here is the kilowatt per capita. And as I said, this is a bit of an old graph now, but effectively the uh, argument is that we have this positive correlation and we're going to expect, in a lot of the scenarios, most of the medium uh, scenarios at least, rather than the worst case scenarios, that everybody is going to progress from the bottom left to the top right of this graph. So we need to make assumptions, for example, about current energy use and eventual GDP uh, when we look at the end of, end of the century energy use and how much we're going to have to uh, plan for. So remember, increases in gross world product <coughs> correlates closely with energy use. Uh, this is just an example of how to calculate GDP, but again, you don't really need to know the details here for this course, so don't worry if that's a little bit confusing. Again, this is a slightly updated graph. Unfortunately, different people plot it in different ways. This one, the vertical axis, shows the power consumption in kilowatt hours per day per person. So that gives you a little bit more personal feel for how much you, in a particular country, are expected to use on average per day. Okay, so that's that axis, and down here again we have the GDP per capita in dollars. And again, you can see this fairly good linear correlation as we move uh, from the bottom left to the top right between power consumption and GDP per capita. And again, you can find these graphs in the discussion in the recommended textbook, Renewable Energy by Mackay. Remember, one kilowatt is 1,000 watts, which is equivalent to 24 kilowatt hours per day. So don't get confused with these units. A kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. The kilowatt hour per day is a unit of power. For example, this is a bit of an old example now, nobody does 40 watt light bulb, but for example, a 40 watt light bulb, if you keep it switched on all the time, uses one kilowatt hour per day. So make sure you understand the difference between those units. 
Okay, so let's make some assumptions and try and calculate what the world energy consumption is going to be in 2100. <coughs> Anybody like to guess what the number of Q per year is going to be by the end of the century? Pick a number. Is it going to be a thousand Q? One Q? Six Q. <laughs> Somebody's been reading the notes. Uh, pretty close. So usually we're into single figures when we look at Qs, okay, for energy use. So that's, that's probably a good one. Okay, let's think about this. Some scenarios that we're going to think about assume that all countries with a low GDP per capita are going to progress from the bottom left to the top right as we saw in that previous figure. Now as a country's GDP increases, it's inevitable that the power consumption per capita is also going to increase too, as we saw in the graph. We need to think a little bit about that and look at some evidence. It's not clear, for example, what consumption this might eventually end up by the end of the century. Is it going to be the same as the maximum one today, or is it going to be different? For example, the average European power consumption is currently about 125 kilowatt hours per day per person. So are we going to assume that everyone will eventually achieve this by the end of the century? Are we going to assume that everybody in Europe is going to continue to use 125 kilowatt hours per day per person? Or is that going to change? We could assume also that in future, technological efficiency measures will allow all countries to attain either the European standard of living with a lower power consumption and some estimates of that suggest that it could be as low as maybe 68 kilowatt hours per day per person but that's the ideal bear in mind that UK industrial activity which got us to this point in terms of our current standard of living is a lot smaller now than it used to be so maybe as other countries go through the same cycle it'd be more sensible to assume a higher target. For example, Hong Kong, which is about 80 kilowatt hours per day per person. Something of that order. What about the gross world product? As we said, that seems to be correlated with energy use. How is that going to change in future? Well, this graph shows the rate of change of gross world product uh, as a function of time. This is from 1971 to 2003. We'll see what it is later in a moment. And so this historical world gross, uh, gross world product growth rate has been about 4% per year. So GDP increases at 4% per year since 1950, actually. So in the scenarios, we tend to look at an average annual growth rate up to 2100. And it tends to range from, say, worst case scenario, about a percent up to just over 3% per year, with a median of, say, 2.3% per year. But well, you notice over that period, it's around about 3.6% per year. So those are sorts of ranges of growth of GDP that we're going to expect. And for example, if you look at the more recent date from 2006 to 2018, again, even accounting for that big blip in 2009, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, we're still looking at around about just over 3% rate of growth per year. So that number, 2 to 3%, or even 4%, is a higher estimate is pretty good. <coughs> so let's think about the future and try and put some limits on what we think might happen. Let's start out in the so-called golden age, 1950 to 1970, which um, occurred just after the Second World War. That period was a period when economic growth was at its maximum, as you might expect. But remember that a lot of the investment that made the subsequent growth possible was actually investment in infrastructure such as power stations, hydroelectric dams, for example. So we can assume that the rate of increase of energy production was also at its maximum during that period, around about 4% per year. So that sort of gives us an upper limit. If we assume that that maximum is going to continue for the next 100 years as a maximum, Energy consumption per year, which we're going to call EN, at some N years after 1970, we can easily calculate. It's just the energy E0 at time 0, which is 1970, and 1 plus R, which is the growth rate, 
to the power n when is the number of years. So that's a typical sort of simple equation we can look at to estimate how the energy consumption is going to change as a function of growth rate. If we use that projection, we end up exceeding 30 Q per year by 2098. That's a very big number. But remember, this is a, uh, the upper end of our estimate. 30 Q, remember we said 30,000 Q per year is absorbed, is absorbed by the planet? That's 1% of that total 3,000. The extra radiation, of course, is going to be lost by re-radiation. I just said something there which should actually give you pause for thought. If we're going to use 30 Q per year as energy for our domestic and industrial use, what happens to that energy? We're converting some kind of fuel into energy for work, etc. What happens to that energy? We said it gets lost eventually by re radiation or heat, a large fraction of it. So, in other words, we're pumping extra heat into our climate system. This has nothing to do with CO2 emissions, this is simply heat by energy conversion what do you think impact that is going to have on our black body radiator. We can use our Stefan Boltzmann law to compare the two. E over E naught is just the absolute temperature ratio, T over T naught to the power of 4. If we're looking at a change of 1% of the net solar input, we're looking at a temperature change of the order of one Kelvin, just from our energy usage, nothing to do with emissions or greenhouse gas effects. Now that's a rather simplistic argument because there are certain issues associated with that assumption, but it's a useful way to constrain our thinking about our energy usage. So if we can stand a 1K rise in global temperature, we shouldn't really think about coping with much more. And remember, it's not due to greenhouse gas emissions, but simply direct heating from energy conversion, something people tend to forget about. Now, we put limits on energy use by saying that the energy that we're going to use will not get above this rising line given by that equation. But let's assume that we're going to say we cannot go above the horizontal line <coughs> subsequently given by 30 Q per year. So that's a very, very simple equation we have there. En equals E naught, 1 plus R to power n. So after about the end of the century, 2098 or so, we're going to assume that energy consumption somehow magically stabilizes and will never go above 30 Q. And we're also going to assume that we're never going to essentially produce energy greater than the slope of that line, uh, uh, the growth rate greater than the slope of that line. But remember, that's you assuming a growth rate in energy use of 4%, which again is uncertain. But it gives you a rough idea about the kind of thinking that goes into how we predict energy consumption. Now, that projection we call a reference projection, and it's going to put an upper limit or a bound on the future energy use. But of course, hopefully we're not going to get anywhere near that number. But let's now consider one of the other drivers, world population growth. We need to estimate the standard of living the desired standard of living to drive uh, a more accurate estimate of future energy consumption. And that's going to also serve to highlight whether we've got a resource problem. Do we have enough fuel resources, enough energy uh, uh, access pro uh, to actually address the amount of energy we need? In other words, do we have a resource problem? And if there is a problem, how big is that gap? And what have we got to do to fill that gap? So we need to make a series of assumptions before we make those estimates. And those assumptions are going to be about where we want our future energy consumption curve in the previous slide to lie. First point, we need to assume that the actual course of events will lie everywhere below that reference projection, but will eventually increase steadily to that constant level. A big assumption we have to assume that the final level is going to be enough to allow the total world population a comfortable standard of living, 
if possible, not lower than that which the developed countries today currently enjoy. And point three, since as we'll see there is actually a resource problem, this level should be as low as possible to mitigate impacts on climate. So we're going to come back to this graph several times now. And this shows the typical demographic model of the so-called trend in world population. <coughs> now the problem is that if we go back to the previous points, points one and two cannot be met unless the world population stabilizes. However, that stabilization has actually occurred in the world's richer countries. <coughs> However, the mass of the population is not in the richer countries, it's in the poorer countries. And the age structure is, apart from catastrophes, wars, etc., such that it's inevitable that the population is going to rise considerably over the next few decades before it starts to stabilize. So in order to gauge world energy use, we need to look at world population trends. So historically, those population trends worked a little bit like this. Typically, they were in balance or slowly increasing, with birth and death rates very, very high. 200 years ago, the death rate began to fall in European countries, but the birth rate remained high for some time, following the death rate downwards. Both, as you can see, from point four there, have now stabilized at much lower levels. Now, in Northern Europe, United States, that passage took about 150 years. So let's go through that a little bit in detail. <coughs> First of all, we can't meet our assumption points one and two unless the world population stabilizes. That has occurred in most rich countries. In other words, the rate of birth to the rate of death is stabilized. The mass population is in poorer countries, and here the age structure, apart from various political, climate-driven catastrophes, such that it's inevitable that the population is going to rise considerably over the next few decades. And in order to gauge world energy use, we have to look at these population trends very carefully. Historically, they were typically in balance, or slowly increasing, with both birth and death rates being very high. 200 years ago, the death rate began to fall in European countries, but the birth rate remained high for some time afterwards, following the death rate downwards. Both have now stabilized at a much lower level, and that demographic transition took about 150 years. The birth rate continues to fall to improved economic circumstances due to improved economic circumstances and social change and development. So, we might ask ourselves, what is driving those birth rate changes? Well, remember we said in stage <coughs> one, birth rate or population levels fluctuated because there was no steady growth. Birth rates were high, death rates were high. Stage two, that began to change around about the year 1800 in the West. Mortality rates began to decline because of improvements in medicine. And that reduced the toll of infectious diseases, which is the biggest killer in countries with high death rates. So eventually the population started to grow. That was in stage two of that graph. If you look at stage three, we get this continuing decrease in death rates. That's accompanied by a decline in birth rates. We also get falling childhood mortality rates, which means that the number of births you need to reach a particular family size drops. In response, fertility rates decline, but the population continues to grow because the number of births in society is based not only on the number of children each woman can bear, but also on the number of women of childbearing age. So with a disproportionate share of people in the childbearing years, population grows even after <coughs> fertility rates decline. And finally, stage four in that graph, the situation in the developed world today, we have a rough parity between birth and death rates. So correspondingly, the 
population grows very slowly, if at all, it might even actually go down. In fact, the only way to drive a population after stage four to higher levels is through immigration. So, if we now look at those trends and see whether or not that demographic model actually works and is characteristic of what we're seeing today, let's look at the population in billions uh, in this top left graph from 1950 uh, to the present year when this report was made and then predictions through to 2050. This is split between regions Africa, Europe, North America, Asia and Oceania, and Latin America and the Caribbean. So that's trends that were assumed. On the right hand side, they plotted the stabilization ratio, in other words, the ratio of births to deaths. One, of course, is no population growth. So you can see the grey line here is the developed countries. That's already stabilized, and if anything is going down slightly. And the same is true of, for example, um, various other regions. For example, if we were to look at the developed regions in grey compared to the developing, you can see the developing are now also coming down markedly as well. Some other regions are a little bit slower to do the same, but they are also predicted to peak certainly before 2025 and are starting to come down now as well. So they all seem to be following this demographic trend where the populations are going to essentially stabilise. So those are the sorts of population predictions that are used when we want to think about future energy use. So make sure you go through those different stages <coughs> and understand why those changes occur, why they're occurring, and also the reasons why we need to understand that. So those are the four stages you should try and learn. Make sure you understand the components. Okay, let's now extrapolate uh, energy use. But I think we need to consider assumption two first. What is our desired standard of living? We've already said a little bit about that. Well, in 1980, the world energy use was about 0.28 kg per year. That was for 4 billion people. Yeah, that's equivalent to about 0.07 Q per year per billion people. So that's the sort of number you should keep in mind. However, that was rather disproportionate when you looked at the different regions. The United States, the figure was 0.07 Q per year for only their population, 0.2 billion people. In other words, their number was 0.35 Q per year per billion. That was their standard of living, effectively. So let's assume that a desirable world standard of living, in fact, currently enjoyed by Americans at the moment, then suppose that with the projected world population from various reports including the recent IPCC, the energy consumption is going to be, well let's split it into high, medium and low shall we? So a high variant, a medium and low, <coughs> let's imagine the high is 16 billion, medium and 11 billion, low 8 billion. Well, using our simple calculation from the values above, we're looking at 5.6 Q, the high estimate, medium estimate, 3.8 Q, low 2.8 Q by the year 2100. So those are the sorts of numbers we need to think about in terms of delivering energy to the future population. It's still a worrying thought, because those numbers are pretty high. Remember, Q is about 10 to the 21 joules. But it's certainly a lot less than that 30 Q per year maximum we estimated from our top-down estimate. Let's be pessimistic and assume that we're going to need about 5 Q per year. So that's a good rough estimate. The next question we have to think about is the time scales for change. Remember, as birth rate declined, that's associated with e economic growth. We have death rate reduction, driven by human health improvements. That's usually pretty rapid in that demographic change. Economic growth is closely linked to an increase in energy supply. So the faster a nation increases its use of energy, the faster its economy will grow. So we have this feedback. And of course, the earlier the birth rate starts to fall and stabilize. 
lowering the birth rate soon reduces that demographic transition time. In the West it took 150 years, but of course it's going much faster now with greater access to more energy. So lowering birth rate reduces the demographic transition time, so that should reduce the final population of the nation over a shorter period, but in the long term it also reduces its final energy burden, we hope. However, at the moment we've ignored the limits that are imposed by the rates, by the economic, sorry, and the rates of change. And that's one of the big uncertainties. To meet an increase in energy demand, we may require substantial changes in the way our system currently functions. We may need to change our economy to preserve or even improve the efficiency of our energy supply. This is already happening to some extent following the Kyoto emissions limitations, uh, which were signed up to by most of the world's countries. But those changes can't be made overnight. They're subject to significant economic constraints. So we need to make some rough estimates of the timescales that are going to be involved. And we're going to continue discussing those timescales in tomorrow's lecture. OK, thank you for coming.
There's not many of you, is there? No. Don't spread out, please. <laughs> Login to the PC for Thank you. It's fine. Don't worry. 